introduce our speaker tonight. It's one of our very own. If you haven't met Tim and Karen Hawkins, they're down on Little Neck Crossing. And uh, Tim uh, is a native, grew up in Nashville, as a 30-year veteran with waste management, worked in New Orleans, just happened to be there at the time when Hurricane Katrina came through, so he got the chance to uh, clean up after that, worked for 10 years in South Florida, and is now in the Houston office as Vice President of Operations. And so, uh, with his busy schedule, I'm very fortunate, we're very fortunate to have him here on a Thursday night with us. So, thank you, Tim. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? So, quickly, um, I'm a... I have the privilege, I appreciate you guys having me here today. Um, I was in front of our board and our CEO earlier this week, and I gotta tell you, it was a little less unnerving than standing here in front of you guys. <laughs> Especially some of the folks that are really passionate about this program, so I'm worried if I make a mistake in any way, Ann's gonna kill me. Ann Weston's gonna come after me. Okay, so three quick disclaimers. Um, I do work for the company. This isn't a marketing presentation, so there's some logos in there. I apologize for it, but otherwise it's going to be about uh, agnostic to any company. It's going to be all about what's going on in the world of recycling. Uh, secondarily, um, we're not the vendor here on Spring Island, so I'm not going to be able to answer any questions about what happens to Spring Island's material or any of those other things, so there won't be any specificity associated with this. Um, and the last piece that I really wanted to key on uh, to make sure that we had it uh, had full disclosure, uh, my knowledge is of the business. I'm not the recycling expert, so I'm the best bad option you got tonight, okay? <laughs> okay, so we got a little, little quiz on the front end. Everybody likes recycling fun facts, I know. <laughs> Does that surprise anyone? Okay, it takes 48,000 aluminum cans to make a ton. So all the references that we're going to talk about here tonight are going to be in, in, in short tons or 2,000 pound tons. Okay, so you need 2,000. So that's, and, and there is some variability to an aluminum can. Most, most people like 12 ounce, some people enjoy 16. Okay, so <laughs> there's a few less. Does that surprise you? A lot of water bottles. About one in three are recycled. Generally. So if you put it in the recycle bin, it's getting recycled. Generally. But what's happened with the manufacturers is part of their uh, sustainability efforts and what they're saying is an environmental impact, uh, they're actually lightweighting the bottles. So there's less plastic in them. You know how you used to be able to stand a water bottle up and it stood up and now you stand it up and it falls over? Yeah. Yeah, it's because it's got less plastic in it. So it actually takes more like 100,000 of them to make a ton now. So we need about 2 billion more bottles to make the same tons that we made five years ago. A lot of water bottles. In 2004, does it surprise anybody that the largest commodity that was recovered was newsprint? I'm going to show you in a little bit. It's changed a little bit. Does that surprise anybody? What was that word? Amazon, yeah. Right? So communities used to get paid pretty pretty handsomely for their recycling programs. And it's, it's on average, a municipality 10 years ago, if they had a recycling program in their community, whoever their, whoever their vendor was, was paying them back somewhere between 30 and 40 bucks for every ton that they pulled off the street. So it was a revenue stream. It was funding a whole lot of other programs. They're having to pay 55 bucks a ton right now. So pretty big shift from what it was to what it is. Disposal rates throughout North America are typically less than $50. So the, 
the concept is it, it actually costs more to recycle than it does to throw it away. And the theme through all of this is this is a commodity driven business. Commodities have peaks and valleys. Anybody buy any gasoline in the last 10 years? Seen it at 4.50 a gallon and $1.99 a gallon. You got sugar, you got coffee, you got plastic, you got aluminum, you got cardboard, you got fiber. It's no different. It's very cyclical. They have big peaks and valleys. Okay, has anybody heard of triple bottom line? Okay, so it's a concept, and it's going to be a premise that's going to thread through this whole, the whole event, the whole evening. It's, it's, a, it's a business concept, so the, it really, you can read the words, but what it essentially says is, is for something to truly be sustainable so that it will last, it has to meet three, three components. It's got to take care of people, planet, and profit if it's going to be sustainable. So that makes sense, right? So the people have to have a passion and a cause. Plenty of that for recycling. There's clearly a benefit to the planet, but if it doesn't make sense financially, it won't sustain. So you gotta, it's a three-legged stool. You gotta have all three. So we're gonna, that'll be the premise through this whole evening. Okay, so let's talk about what's happened uh, up until the last year or so. So this is a, this is a US EPA slide that essentially says, and it's dated 2014, you'd think I'd have one better than this, but this is the material I got. Um, so you got, here's what's changing in the last 15 years from 1990 through 2000, uh, or actually 25 years through 2014. Um, you see a lot less newspaper, a little less glass, fractional changes of steel, and if you can't read this, I'm reading them off, some fiber aluminum cans, a little bit of other aluminum and paper, and then all the stuff on the right, where it's purple, where it's growing, is all plastic, with the exception of cardboard all the way out to the right. So there's a lot more plastic, a lot more cardboard in the stream. So if you go to a processing facility and you took a representative sample, whether it's one ton or 100 pounds or whatever it is, and you sorted it all out and you got percentages of equivalency of what's in that, that unit. You got about 30%, which is cardboard, that's OCC. Almost 30%, which is mixed paper. Mixed papers like newsprint, junk mail, uh, anything that'll generally tear. You got a little bit of other fiber. And you got 15% glass. It's very heavy by weight. There's a lot less glass going in than it used to be though. The You've got, I'm going to skip over a couple, and you've got residue. Anybody got any idea what residue is? Ketchup. Non-recyclable. <laughs> Non-recyclable. What? It's garbage. It's contamination. Go look in the container down there tonight. You'll see it. Some of you probably want to talk about that later, but again, I'm not your vendor, so... <laughs> So I, I do want to focus in on these, these little slivers, okay? Um, it's things, it's words like aluminum and steel, tin cans, HDP is milk jugs, uh, laundry detergent bottles, PET is water bottles, those kinds of things, soft drink bottles. It's not much of the stream if you look at it, it's like 7%. You guys seeing that? By weight, remember, you need 100,000 water bottles and 60,000 aluminum cans. So that's a lot of units versus a wine bottle, which probably weighs almost a pound by itself. Mm -hmm. So if you, look at, if you look at that same unit on what it's worth from a commodity perspective, this is kind of revealing. The same... 7% that gave you very little volume is actually most of your revenue. Aluminum's like 1,500 bucks a ton right now. Plastic's four or 500 bucks a ton. So it's worth pulling it out because it's pretty valuable. Glass is the first one, or actually glass is the red. There are numbers less than zero. 
when you when you go five, four, three, two, one, you actually go to negative one, two, three. So it's coming at a cost. So whatever we do with glass, and in this case, our mixed paper right now, we're having to pay to get rid of it. Nobody's buying it. Pretty tough market. There's a silver lining at the end. It's sitting there, I'll be gloom and doom the whole way through. Does that surprise anybody? So, so, so very little of your material is actually worth much. So we're modifying a lot of the processing techniques so that you go after the stuff that's worth money. You know, a quick saying is if you pull out a pocket full of change, you throw it on the ground, you got two seconds to pick it up, what are you going to pick up? Quarters. Quarters. You're not going to worry about the pennies. So that's kind of what's going on here. Make sense? Yes. Okay, so this is a, just a quick, this is a quick example of what's going on for some of the communities. The commodity revenues decreased significantly. I'll show you here in a second just how much. Processing costs have gone up because we're having a change to go after the quarters. We're not, we're not recovering everything anymore. You're only getting the stuff that's really worth a value. And I'm gonna show you here in a little bit, the, the primary reason for that is there's no market for the other material. So you can, you can throw it in the container all you want and recycle it and process it all you want, but if you don't have anything to do with it, it's garbage. Some cases, as you see, the revenue from the commodities two years ago would have been about 120 bucks on the top. Now it's worth $38. The processing costs a couple years ago would have been about 80 bucks a ton. All of these are in tons. Now it's gone up again because we're having to do things differently. So what was a $40 profit two years ago is a $92 loss today on a tonnage basis. And if you're a big community, uh, if you're Atlanta, Georgia, or you're the MSA there, you might generate 200,000 tons of recycling a year. That's, that's a pretty big negative. So there's not a long line of people lined up to say, I want to do this for you. So what it's saying is, you're going to have to pay for it. And unfortunately, cities across North America are canceling their programs. Not many. There's a handful that are. So this is what's happened to the, to the blended average of what a ton's worth. So if you look at back to 2015, you kind of get a peak here in 2017, what we were talking about just a minute ago at 120 bucks. It's all the way down to less than $40 right now. Pretty tough, pretty tough market. So why has all this happened? Primarily, the Chinese have quit buying commodities. Anybody heard about that? You read about that? So there's two or three things that they've done. Uh, about 25% of the plastic and paper throughout the world went to China because they were resource restrained, raw material restrained. They also had an economy with a 7% GDP for about 10 years that's rocked back down to somewhere in the ones and twos now. So that's slowed down some things as well. They began putting bans in place um, a handful of years ago that essentially did two things. One, they didn't want to buy any, any fiber with, with moisture in it because when, when the fiber gets wet, the, the fibers do something different when you get ready to recycle them if they're wet versus dry. Uh, the second piece is, is they were, they got really strict around, they were going to, they were going to make certain that you had very clean, pristine material that you were going to sell them. So in the past, we would make a bale of plastic or aluminum or cardboard or whatever it is, and it might have four or five percent other stuff in it. Because if you go look in that container out there, there's a lot of other stuff in it, okay? And you do your best to process it, and then you'll see a little video here in a minute with some technology that shows you exactly what can happen. Well, they got to a point where they, were say, they said, we're not gonna buy the world's garbage. We're not gonna pay you to send us four or 5% garbage anymore. So they put a 0.5% prohibit, prohibitive limit on their bales. Almost no one can meet that. The technology doesn't exist. You have to put humans on it, and at that point, it's just not economically feasible. So you go back to that triple bottom line, it really doesn't make sense to continue to do this. 
All of those things have, have essentially forced the U.S. markets to respond because there's plenty of supply, it's not enough demand. Clearly, that's why the price is depressed. But there is a demand for more and more recycled content, and that's one of the key themes we'll kind of look at at the very end. So there are mills and markets being developed in, in the states. So where's the material going? You can see a couple years ago, it was 27%, now it's 3% is going to China. That's a lot of material when you're talking 10 million tons, okay? So we've had to make markets in Vietnam, in India, in Brazil, Mexico's flat, and a little bit in Europe and primarily the UK. So, so we're having to make markets where they weren't before to find places to, f to sell commodities. This is just a, another illustrative example of, this is paper on this side, see what was going to China? It stopped. They quit buying it, the price went down and they wanted 0.5% uh, prohibitives in there that nobody can meet. So you send very little there anymore. The technology doesn't exist to clean it to that degree. This is plastic over here, pretty big spike. You see it ramp up in advance of the Olympics and it flattens out about 2012. So the processes are kind of stuck in the middle. You got all the demand over here from aspirational recycling. Everybody wants to recycle more. They want everything recycled. They're not worried about contamination, and they, want it to, they don't want it to cost anything. They really want it for free. Get that. <laughs> See, I'm multitasking here. I've got, got cockroaches and everything going on. Don't you ask the garbage guy to come in and get it, right? <laughs> if, if that's not... Yeah, I'm not going to go there. So, so on the back side, you got you got a lack of end markets. So they're being make the demands are you got to improve your quality. The cost is increasing. The value is worth about half of what it was before, and there's limits on technology. So one key here is just because you put it in the bin doesn't mean it's recycling. Okay. And the whole goal of recycling, just to be really simplistic, is to avoid throwing it away, right? We'll come back to that. So that is one of our facilities, probably a $25 million facility that is automated. That, and I'm going to show you a little video here in a minute. You're going to see, uh, you'll see some technology. You'll see some robots. You'll see some of the technology that we use or we utilize to get to clean the material. But that's what happens when you get material that you don't want in there. So the, the line is shut down, you got 50 people standing around doing nothing, and you got some guys in there with knives and saws cutting material off of these screens. Hopefully this will work. One of the most effective methods we've seen for reducing contamination is educating customers through tagging on their recycle bin. It also has a link to our website that has additional resources for education. I have a camera and a truck. Even when I'm done with the container, I can see what is a good recycle and a good recycle. We also have cameras that go inside the bins. We are able to identify the contaminants as they go in and notify customers right away that they've got material going in the bin that doesn't belong. We found that by recruiting recycling ambassadors, often children, they actually go home and educate their parents about what to put in recycling. Bottles, cans, and paper. That's all they got to worry about in your recycling bin. Now the three items you never want to see is food and liquid, plastic wraps and bags. Those need to go back to the grocery store. And then foam, we don't want foam here. So can I rely on you not to see my recycling ambassadors with me? Yeah! We need recycling education to help customers about how to recycle right. Only bottles, cans, paper, and cardboard go to recycling. 
when people put other things in there, like plastic bags, water hoses, Christmas tree lights, we spend more time getting those materials out and not enough time sorting through good material. Education and technology do go hand in hand with waste management. We've invested over $1 billion in recycling infrastructure that includes equipment and technology, and we are constantly looking for ways to improve the recycling program. As the trucks come into the facility, the first area they go to is the tipping floor. We are starting to use cameras and other technologies to help us identify contaminants right when they come into the tipping floor area. Once the material leaves, the area goes to a call of resort. This is where big contaminants are sorted out, usually by people. One of the technologies we use is an optical sorter. It uses air and cameras and can sort about 600 items per minute. When you compare that to the typical human sorter, it's about 10 times more efficient. A ballistic separator is a piece of sorting equipment where fine material falls through the screen. Containers fall off the bottom whereas lightweight material floats over the screen. Recycling centers are essentially manufacturing plants, and we want to make the best product we can. From the moment we touch the material, we use technology to gather data about what the material is doing so that we can use that information to help educate customers about how to recycle the product. That way, we can all work together to improve the environment. Okay, so you saw a little technology there. So any one of those plants is probably a 20 to $50 million investment. And believe it or not, we'll build them all day long because it's a great return on our investment for us. It's, a, it's an incredibly good ROIC for us. You just gotta charge for it. And it's gonna probably be more expensive right now than it is for throwing it away. So look, these are a couple of examples of what we pull out of the stream. Believe it or not, we get two of these a day. <laughs> so, if, if, if anybody needs one, we can make you a deal on them, okay? So you saw the, that rotary equipment that was moving at high speeds. Can you imagine what a garden hose does to that? It, or, or clothing, or a coat hanger, okay? Uh, look, it's steel, it's recyclable. Not so much, okay? Okay, so where is this headed? What's going to change? So you're going to start to see some legislation come, both local and federal. Um, there's already bottle bills in a handful of communities across, across. Some of you may live in states when you're not here where you pay five cents for a piece of glass, or I remember as a kid running around trying to find them so I could go buy candy. But, um, the packaging resources and the people who put the material in the package do not want that because it makes the cost go up. So they're fighting it, so you kind of got opposing pressures to like any legislative event. But you're gonna see some changes come legislatively because people want to recycle. Everybody wants to do it. It's socially irresponsible not to. We all know this. It, it's, a, it's a very compelling argument to be made for the environment. You can't really make one that's not not positive, so it's, it's, people are gonna do it, but you're gonna start to see a lot of single-use plastic bands. This is a quick little sample of what's changed across America. These are laws that have been put into place. No big surprise to me that California is on the top with a few more than everybody else. The green are plastic bags. So if you go anywhere in Beaufort County right now, can you buy can you buy something? Does it go in a plastic bag anymore? Yes. Well, it's kind of plastic. It's a hundred-use plastic bag now. I went to Lowe's today, and they gave me a bag, and I said, oh, I forgot my bags. And they said, no, no, this is a reusable bag. And I said, all bags are reusable. And she goes, no, this is reusable. It has a hundred uses. I said, well, you know what I said. <laughs> I can speculate what you said, but. So you're starting to see communities get on board with this. So you go anywhere near the coastal communities between here and down through Florida and around, straws are a big deal to marine life, okay? So you won't see, you won't see plastic straws. You go anywhere in California right now, you won't get a plastic straw. 
you'll get a paper straw or you won't get one. You don't have to ask for it, which is probably actually the best solution. So you're, you'll start to see more and more and more of this because single-use plastics are kind of the dearth of the industry right now. So this is from a National Ge Geographic Council sum uh, summary. Does it surprise anybody that the number one concern is not climate change, but plastics? <laughs> climate change is a much bigger deal than plastics, I gotta tell you. But that's what people are talking about. Anybody know anything about the, the ocean plastic issue in the Pacific? There's, there's, a, there's a glob of plastic about the size of Texas out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that was really exacerbated by the tsunamis a couple years ago. And there's, unfortunately, some of the developing nations that have high single-use plastic, their primary source of disposal is the ocean. So again, you'll start to see some legislative events passed. These are, these are specific details. California is way ahead on this from, from everybody else. So what's next? So a couple things recycling is not. It's not a feel-good activity to justify your purchases. So if there's not a market, it's not recycling. It's not a trash alternative. Doesn't make you feel good about putting less stuff in one can because you put it in another. Right? It's not a solution for low quality material. It's not the solution to marine de uh, plastic debris. And it's not free anymore. What it is, it's a commodity business. It's market driven. So you saw that $120 a couple years ago when everybody's getting paid. I'll guarantee you in the next five to seven years, it'll be back to that. It's just cyclical. You can, you can watch it. So the key is when, you, when you're in this trough where you're at, how do you sustain and maintain it? So I'll give you a couple of examples here in a minute. So I, I'm really going to end with this. Um, what do you need to do to help? What, what can you do? Understand what is recyclable and what's not. Okay, so you want fiber, you want cans, you want bottles. That's about it. That's about all you can recover right now. All these other items, these unique plastic items that should be recyclable, there's no market for it, unfortunately. So you can throw it in there, it's just gonna be garbage to the processor. So if you really wanna get to a point that things are working great, you wanna put fiber in, you wanna put cardboard in, you wanna put plastic bottles, mostly water bottles and soda bottles, milk jugs, and then of course your tin cans and of course your aluminum. No aspirational re recycling. It's called wish cycling. I wish somebody would recycle this, right? Biggest thing that people can do is buy and support anything that's got recycled content products in it. There's no markets for a lot of this material. That's how we're going to develop markets. That's, how, that's what that legislation is going to do a couple of slides back. It's going to demand that people use recycled content. So, you, so our federal government in their procurement standards has no recycled content standards for any of their goods or services. That's one of the things that's probably going to be changing pretty quickly. That'll make a big market for some of this material as people are demands are made to go into it. Now we're all going to pay a little more for it, but if you want the program to work, we're talking pennies, not dollars. So forever there were three chasing arrows and, and you looked at reduce, reuse, and recycle. Anybody heard of that? The three R's of recycling? Yeah. Well, now there was a fourth one. You see the first one? Refuse. So if you don't need a bag, don't take a bag. If you don't need a straw, don't take a straw. If there's some way you can sustain without it, refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle. Make sense? Yeah. What questions do you guys have for me?